it's so good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Drew. Really appreciate it. Uh, in January 19th of this past year, at the age of 62, and for the first time in my life, I got married. <laughs> six years, and I really just built this cocoon around me. I just was isolated from the world, and I did not want to get out of it. I was quarantining my heart. I didn't want anybody to touch that heart. Uh, I have been with my partner, gay man, uh, well before gay men could get gay married, and I was with him for 18 years. And my new husband, Joel, was with his husband, for 34 years. So we had this relational history between us that was just amazing. It was like a sequoia tree that was just rings around all the love that we had. Just amazing. And we both decided we just wanted to add one more ring to it, and that was going to be a wedding ring. Uh, we had met two years previously, and I was just ready to give up on any kind of relationship. I had let go of all of the um, social networking. I just got really sick and tired of me, you know, just meeting friends with benefits. And that's all I was doing. I was going out, I was getting my fun, but it was just people I didn't know. So I, I wanted to stop that. So I just said, get off of all the social networking. I clicked the last button to say, I am canceling my account. And it emailed me right back and said, okay, you're canceled, but you have the rest of this billing season that's still on. <laughs> that night, Joel sent me a message. It was so cool. I got it. We met, and we sort of clicked. I was really happy about that. Uh, he was the first, we hung out a little bit at the beginning, but he was the first person in ages who I had slept with who I had the honor of knowing both his first name and his last name. <laughs> first date was a pretty much of a mess, though. Uh, Joel had sent me the wrong address of where to meet, and I just didn't know what to do. I was running around, I finally had a little bit more technical luck than we're having tonight, and I managed to find him, and I ran, I tore ass to find him. And I was so sweaty, it was this hot September day. And I walked in, and I just was profusely sweaty. And I apologized profusely. I said, you know, I'm just a sweaty mess, I really apologize. And he just looked up with his grin and his glint in his eyes and said, it's okay, I like sweat. That was the beginning of all good things. We talked and we talked and we talked for that first date. We had to pay a little bit extra to stay at the Waverly Diner through lunch and into dinner so that people, you know, were going to take our spot. And right before we left, Joel gave me another big piece of news. He said, you know, we're going to get to know each other a little bit better, but you better know right from the beginning, I am a Judy Garland, Ethel Merman loving fag, <laughs> with a lifetime subscription to International Figure Skating Magazine. <laughs> International Figure Skating Magazine? What the hell was that? I knew I was meeting a really special guy. So we started seeing each other. <coughs> Excuse me. And Joe was really big on public displays of affection. We always went around Brooklyn Heights where he lived, Lower East Side where I was living, holding hands. And I thought it was just out of love for each other, but then I realized he was doing it for me to hold me up and him to be held up as well. So we got through that. We get the regular and Oz, you know, they are cute old coots together. And look at those two, it's just so wonderful. And Joel's humor, which was raunchy and raucous, would come into effect. So as soon as he heard, isn't that cute? We'd go by them, he'd turn around and say, yeah? The reality is we're brothers. Is it cute now? <laughs> <laughs> we just didn't stop with that stuff. So we finally decided at our age, we had to finally make a move. We could, you know, we couldn't just keep going on and on and on like the youngins do with long engagements. So we decided to get married. And I got down on one knee and I proposed. And Joel said yes. And then he had to help me out. 
so embarrassing. But we did set the date, January 19th, like I said before, and we had a fantastic celebration at Housing Works in the city, in Manhattan. And it was great, our families and friends were there. It was really a once in a lifetime, just unforgettable party that celebrated our love together. And then the shit hit the fan for the whole world. <laughs> we got news within three weeks of the pandemic and we were scared. He had moved in with me on the Lower East Side and that was really an epicenter. It was really a hot spot. We saw people in our building getting sick and dying mostly people of color, and we were really pissed about that. We saw stores closing left and right in our neighborhood. We just were not used to what was going on. And to top it all off, within a week of all of that, I lost my job. So we said, well, you know something? We could face this with the frivolity and the whimsy of Joel. We could face this by moving up. We had the privilege of having a small little place in the Sullivan County area of the Catskills a little town by the name of Eulen. So we moved up into there. It was like Green Acres for two old gay queens. It was crazy. <laughs> uh, we decided it was going to be a quarantine honeymoon. So our European honeymoon was on hold, but we were going to cure, uh, quarantine and just be there for each other. But I reverted back to a lot of old behaviors. Low self-worth, anxiety, just not being able to relate closing down. And Joel noticed that. He picked up on it. He became the whimsical yin to my anxiety-ridden yang. And he just made things so light. He wanted to be as goofy as he could be at the beginning. We would have our daily walk to the post office, and he'd have these imaginary conversations with wildlife, with deer, with hawks, with squirrels, with woodchucks. <laughs> Listen, Mr. Squirrel, leave Richard's bird house alone. Don't eat that. And he'd have the two-way conversation. Mr. Squirrel saying, that's right, Joel, I'll do it. Don't you worry. I'll stay away. But I can't guarantee for my buddies. It was wild. It was like I was stuck in this real freakish, couldn't believe, scene from a crazy version of Disney Snow White. He was just talking to everything in nature, and they were answering back in his voice. <laughs> uh, slowly, effortlessly, hysterically, he got me out of my shell. So we'd go to that you know, post office every day. The other thing we passed on the way to the post office was a Catholic church, and they had this big, big monument. It was a tombstone with about a hundred little white crosses all around it. And we read the tombstone the first day, and it was in memory of all those unborn who were deprived of the opportunity to be born. So what does Joel do? Start daily conversations with the unborn. And they'd answer back. So he'd say, hey, how you doing, kids? And they'd say, aren't you the Jew? Get out of here! You killed our Lord! You <laughs> and they found a friend, get the fuck out of here! different conversations every day. And he wouldn't stop with this. It was crazy. Um, he was also starting his next play. Joe was a playwright. And he was writing this wild play called Cold Blooded. It was an homage to the 1950s horror B movies with blonde bombshells. And the premise was it dealt with a secret cult of people that turned into alligators when they were sexually why couldn't he skip the Peter Skating magazine? <laughs> and then he comes up with this idea. You know, I'm putting all these scenes in it. Will you practice with me? Let's act out a passionate sex scene. <laughs> <laughs> so there we were, grunting, snarling, chopping our teeth, pretending to hit each other with imaginary tails, and making all this noise in the world. It just was. Crazy love making. You know, most people, when you talk about old people's sex, they get a little bit squigged out. And they should. It's not that, not that pleasant to look at or hear. All the noises, the sights, the sounds, the smells. And you gotta prepare for it all the time, too. You have to make sure.
that you're getting a good night's sleep. <laughs> you have to make sure that you ate well the day before so your digestion doesn't come into play. <laughs> you have to make sure that you didn't down any gassy foods. You have to make sure that you trimmed your nose hairs and your ear hairs. So we did all of that. We always started our lovemaking with a Viagra. <laughs> and we always ended our lovemaking with an Aleve. <laughs> and I was just crazy alligator sex. I was just doing my back end. And it was the only time during the pandemic I was pissed that I couldn't get to see a chiropractor. <laughs> Slowly, I started realizing that we were doing scene after scene after scene. And that's when I realized Joel's not going to put any of these scenes into cold blood into play. He's doing this for me. All of the crazy lovemaking, all of the talking to the unborn, all of the whiling away the hours conversing with the flowers and the woodchucks and the squirrels, all of that was one big improv session to keep me light, mindful, and happy. And I was just so glad he did that. In the midst of this pandemic, I was communing with nature again. I was falling in love even more deeply with this man who I wanted to spend my life with. And I was laughing uncontrollably. So in this unparalleled time of quarantining, of isolation, of social distancing, I never felt so close or so liberated. But I still won't read a figure skating magazine. <laughs> <laughs> This is Bob Dylan.